Good morning. Good morning. Now, I usually say good afternoon, but uh, today is Wednesday, April, April, I almost said January, April 7th, 2021, for all of you archaeologists who are going to discover these videos in about four centuries. This is the historical marker for you, April 7th, 2021. And, uh, this is the Book of the Month Bible Study at Christ the King Lutheran Church here in Riverview, Florida. And just for history's sake, when you archaeologists discover this, I'm Pastor Kevin Yoakum. So you can look up my descendants and, and, and tell them that you found their, uh, their great ancestors' uh, Bible study videos, okay? <laughs> Anyway, I do apologize that the Bible study was not available yesterday on Tuesday for those who were looking for it. I'm just going to say I was not able to start on time, uh, and I tried twice. I'm here now, all right? And we're here for the Bible study. So I'm going to put an hour on the clock, and uh, we will get started here. It is the two, three days after Easter, and so we're still living in the glow and the joy of the celebration of Easter, of our salvation, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in that good news, let us begin our Bible study with a prayer, all right? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings, your grace, and your enlightenment today as we come to uh, this new book in our Bible study time, as we come to your word, uh, teach us, enlighten us, and change our lives uh, and change our living by what we see here, that we may see uh, the heart of God expressed through Jesus Christ for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, yes, it's the book of the month Bible study, and it's the first Tuesday slash Wednesday in April. And so uh, we're starting a new book. We're going to do the book of Colossians, okay? It is an epistle, epistle, uh, which is just the Greek word for a letter, you know, a letter that you write from one person to another, right? I like to joke with the kids, you know, what are the epistles? And one of the old jokes is, those are the ones who marry the apostles. <laughs> Crazy pastor joke, right? Um, anyway, uh, so we're going to be in the book of the epistles. Uh, the book of Colossians. Now, so this is Paul, the Apostle Paul's letter to the Colossians. What are Colossians? Those are the people that live in the city of Colossa, okay, which would be somewhere in the area of Greece and probably in between, you know, if you're doing on a map, in between Greece and Turkey. Uh, if, if I got that right and not not going the other way towards Rome but towards Turkey so somewhere in there and you can look it up on the map but I just can't do maps very well on this video uh, I just do live streaming I don't do cut and paste slides and things like that uh, that would be pretty cool anyway so let us begin here today uh, Paul's epistle to the Colossians chapter 1 so the first two verses are, are like um, standard format for all of the epistles, and it goes like this. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossa, grace to you and peace from God our Father. All right, so uh, we see there, you know, Paul, this is the way a, a letter would start. You know, we would say, you know, dear John, dear Aunt Matilda, or something like that. We would start off with, uh, you know, dear so-and-so. But the old format in, in this time was to start off who's writing and who you're writing to. So before anything, you open up the letter, The maybe it's a scroll, right? You open up the, the letter. And you just look at the first two lines, who's it to, and who's it, who's it from, and who's it to. All right, see, it's that simple. So, uh, so this it identifies it already. This is from the Apostle Paul. And if you don't know him, you go, okay, somebody and a, says he's from Christ Jesus. So some, one of those new Christian guys, uh, these new Christians, which are an offshoot of the Jewish faith. Remember, it's first century, right? Um, one of these new Christian guys, I don't know, some weirdo. Or, but if you know, you go, it's from Paul. It's from the Apostle Paul, right? 
and uh, he says he is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. It's not that he said, I think I'm going to become an apostle. It's He was going about his life, and actually in very evil ways, and God came to him and said, Saul, you need to become an apostle. I'm making you an apostle. You, you're coming to faith in Jesus Christ. <laughs> he gave him faith right then, right? And uh, you are going to be my messenger to take this good news of Jesus Christ out into the 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 world and it really across the Mediterranean from uh, Jerusalem all the way to Rome uh, if you look on the map and you can get an idea for that right so and Timothy our brother so you can imagine here so Paul is writing or what often happens is that Paul it seems would have a scribe so his letters would come, you know, he would dictate, and then maybe someone would be the, the scribe. I forget what they called him. Um, and so maybe, maybe Timothy is scribing for him, is writing it down, taking dictation, right? Uh, or maybe it's that Paul and Timothy are there together uh, and somehow composing this letter. And uh, it's all written in the first person kind of a thing and so we don't we don't give Timothy uh, authorship we uh, primarily just consider it Paul because that's the voice spoken to assume that Timothy had any authorship would only be an assumption right so but or maybe he's just like it's coming from both of us I'm writing the letter but Timothy gives it his his thumbs up he wants it but so However, the case, verse 1 says it's from Paul, and Paul says, And Timothy, our brother. And who's it to? To the saints and faithful brothers in Christ Jesus at Colossa. So it's going to the town of Colossa, to the Christian church, to those who are saints and faithful brothers, Christians, in Christ. So, um, a saint. I know I've said this before. Uh, today we either say, "Oh, you're a saint," when someone brings us an extra Kleenex or something, right? Um, but uh, or we'll think, "Ah, a saint is someone who must be holy, Roman Catholic, dead, and has done three miracles," right? Uh, or something like that. Uh, or I saw that movie with Val Kilmer. Huh. All right, something like that. Uh, no, a saint is someone who is a believer in Christ. The word saint really just means the one who's holy. And we have been made holy. We have been sanctified. Sanctified saint. Okay, right? We have been sanctified, made holy by the Holy Spirit, sanctified in Christ Jesus. Um, and so a saint is any believer in Christ. A saint is any believer in Jesus Christ. All right? We need to know that and remember it because uh, we don't want to think that a saint is someone who only shows up in the in the Roman Catholic history books. Now, I'm not picking on Roman Catholics. Uh, that We do have a difference of opinion. and No, we have a difference in teachings on, on several points of doctrine. And, and so uh, one of them is going to be what do we regard as a saint? And we believe the scriptures are here saying to the saints and faithful brothers, to those who are in Christ at Colossa, to the fellow Christians. Um, all right. And so uh, there we go. And so and here's the greeting, you know, dear brother John, you know, hello from sunny Florida <laughs> or something like that. No, here is the greeting that they have grace and peace to you from God, our father. Uh, what a wonderful blessing. If you don't consider it, oh, it's just a formality, move on. No, to think, what is the, the wish and the desire of this person writing the letter that the people reading the letter would have? God's grace, God's undeserved love for them, and God's peace that they would be whole and fulfilled and united and still and calm in Christ in God our Father through Jesus Christ. Okay? All right, so, yeah, okay, let's get past the greeting and get on to the bigger stuff. <laughs> but 
I just want to say the, the greeting is worth seeing too. But let's move on to verse 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, is as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Okay, so here we are, and he says, Grace to you, all my dear friends in Colossa. And you're not, I'm not sure if he has been there at this time. I, I'm just going to say I don't, I don't know that. Uh, I'd have to dig. It wouldn't take much to find out to see if we believe he has been there. Uh, we believe this is written sometime around A.D. 60. Okay? Um, but he is saying, We've heard of your faith. Now that doesn't mean uh, he hasn't been there, but it could mean that, right? Uh, we've heard of your faith. It could mean I've been there and I keep hearing stories about this Christian Colossal church. Uh, but he says, we always thank God, the Father of Jesus, when we pray for you. So he's saying, when we pray for, I do pray for you. That's one thing he says. And when I pray for you, when we pray for you, it is a prayer of thanks. It is a prayer of thanks because I've heard about what this church in Colossa is doing and I'm so thankful, right? We have heard of your faith in Christ and of the love you have for all the saints, all right? Now, this is uh, something that keeps showing up more and more in my mind as I study the scriptures. I keep seeing it and, you know, we want to say, well, I don't want to talk about doctrines. I want to talk about deeds. I don't, you know, deeds, not creeds, or something like that, and it's a false dichotomy, all right? We are not supposed to divide teachings and and the our adherence to the teachings, to the Word of God, from what we do. You know, some people will say, uh, make that kind of a deeds, not creeds. Let's just do this and not worry about the, the book, the, the book learning. No, the book learning is the Word of God. It's the Bible. And there is a, a bit of book learning. Uh, there is something to be said for knowing what the Bible says. Uh, a pastor recently said on a podcast, uh, I, I do podcasts. That's how I learn a lot of things these days. Um, and a pastor recently said on, on a podcast, is, he said, if you're not reading the Bible, you're forgetting it. I thought, oh. Now, you could kind of say, well, wait a minute. I... Uh, when we ponder the scriptures, I'm not forgetting it, but he's saying if you're not regularly in the word, you're starving yourself and your and your knowledge of the word will fade if you're not regularly in it. Okay? So, you know, you can oh, I want to nitpick what he said, but the the essence of what he said is if you're not reading the Bible, if you're not in the word of God, it's fading from your heart and mind. If you're not reading the Bible, you're forgetting it. All right? Now, if, if, well, what about the guy in prison who can't get a Bible? Okay, so keep it in your heart and your mind, in your heart and in your mind, right? So that when those times come, you may keep it in your heart and mind as long as possible. You may keep it there. Uh, you know, there's the old stories about uh, prisoners who had uh, got locked together and they would say, okay, Tell us everything you can know about the Bible so that we can compile uh, as much as we know about the Bible and kind of build it for each other and have a Bible. That's, I think that's a great thing. Okay, back to this. So we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. See, the, the, the love for all the saints that some people would say, let's do the deeds of love. It is the same as, and it goes together with, your faith in Christ Jesus. 
So that's why I say, if people say deeds, not creeds, it's a false dichotomy that you would try to separate them. Why not have them both, right? Why not have faith and love, right? That, don't try to separate them. Do both, right? Have your faith in Christ Jesus and love people around you. It's a common phrase today in churches just to say, love God, love others. And it's just a simple way of reminding us, you know, that we live in, you know, we love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind and with all our strength. And uh, we love one another as God has loved us through Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, so uh, you've had for the saints. And he says in verse 5, you, this faith and love you have because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Uh, because of the good news that has been proclaimed to you. He says, of this you heard before in the word of truth. All right, now hold on. Our two more important words right to follow. And you can look, but I want to talk about this first. So he's saying that this good news that brings faith and love is the word of truth. Truth. That is a powerful, sticky, wicked word in today's world. What is truth? People want to say, well, they want to, you have your truth and I have my truth. Well, yeah, I have what I believe to be true and I think you're wrong. <laughs> right? Now, I'm not trying to be rude and I shouldn't say, I think you're wrong. Um, but what I'm saying is if you believe something to be true, then it will follow that, yes, you will think someone who believes differently holds to a wrong belief. True. Not a uh, my truth, which would sound like a preference, right? Pizza is great. Now, you can make that and you can say that's an undeniable truth. And someone else would say, I disagree. <laughs> All right. So either someone's wrong about pizza or they just have a different opinion about how pizza is, right? And if you think pizza is great, is not an opinion, but an undeniable truth, you know, but we're not talking about pizza here. We're talking about the news of Jesus Christ that gives us faith and love, all right? So he calls it the truth. And what is this truth? The gospel. Those are the next two words there in verse five. You have heard the word of truth, the gospel. All right, and that's why we get to this phrase, the gospel truth. That's the gospel truth, right? Um, because we're trying to say this gospel message of Jesus Christ is true. Not my truth, but it is the truth given to us by the one holy triune God and there are no other gods right Christianity makes very strong claims that the truth is found in Jesus Christ and the truth is the gospel the death the message of Jesus Christ and our salvation through his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins all right Christianity makes very strong truth claims, right? And this is important to know. And it's not that we want to walk around going, you believe a lie, you believe a lie. No, we don't want to be mean. But we do believe that the Bible is right. And something that contradicts the Bible is therefore wrong. So some people will want to say, well, Jews, Christians, and Muslims all have the same God. Whoa, whoa. Uh, ask a Muslim that. Do you believe in a triune God, Father, Son, Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit? And a Muslim will say, no, Jesus is not God. Now ask a Jewish person that. Do you believe that God, uh, the God of the Jewish faith, is a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the Son is Jesus Christ? And a Jewish person will say, no. Jesus is not our God. And uh, so we have a different God. Because Christians, we say God is the triune God. 
and you can't cut two thirds of him away and say, well, if you got the Father, then you got, then we all have the same God. We can't do that. We can't cut Jesus out of the Godhood. We can't cut the Holy Spirit out of the Godhood. So the gospel is the truth, and we say. Our truth claims in the Christian faith is that if it's not, if it contradicts and denies the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm sorry, dear neighbor, but that is not the gospel. That's not the truth. And we would say, I believe it to be false. I believe it to be a false religion, a false teaching, a false hope, a false gospel. Right? Now, of course, the other person's going to say, well, you have your faith and I have mine. That's correct. And in my teachings, you have a different faith than I. And I do believe, dear neighbor, in all Christian love, um, that I'm correct and you're wrong. You know, so we can't all be right. We can't all be right if we have opposing views. All right. So the truth in verse five. And now what does he say about this gospel word of truth? In verse 6 he says, Which has come to you, and you know, so the gospel has come to them. The news of Jesus Christ has made it to the Christian church in Colossa. And, and he says, As indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing. So he's saying the gospel is spreading throughout the whole world. And it's the Mediterranean and wherever the other apostles have gone. You know, there's um, legend at least. I don't know if, about if it's fact or established um, that some of the other apostles maybe made it to India even or to China. Um, and so, you know, this gospel message is growing throughout the whole world. Pardon me for a yawn. I'm sorry. Uh, as it does also among you. Uh, since the day you heard it and understood it, for, uh, understood the grace of God and truth. All right. And then he says, just, it's the same thing you were taught by Epaphras, our beloved servant there. Seems to be the minister. In verse 7, 7 says, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. Uh, you know, which is a great thing to say. Um, if someone says, if someone said to me, Pastor Yoakum says, is a faithful pastor serving the Lord for the sake of these people at Riverview, I would be very humbled at that great compliment. It is my hope that I am a faithful pastor. It is my hope that I serve the Lord by serving the people here at Christ the King Lutheran Church and the community around us, right? Um, uh, and so that, what a great compliment paid to Epaphras. Now, do I know his name is Epaphras? No, maybe it's Epaphras. I don't know, Epaphras. I don't know. But uh, I always tell people, if you sound confident, we'll believe that's how it's said. So Epaphras, we'll say. He is a faithful minister and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. So that's how I hear about you. Epaphras writes me letters and tells me is probably what he's saying there. Okay? All right. Here we go. Verse 9 and following. Oh, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened in all power, with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy giving thanks to the father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins Wow, so there's so much there. <laughs> As always, whenever Paul writes, one paragraph says about a whole book's worth of information. Uh, so, from the day we heard of you, we have not ceased to pray for you. Okay, what a compliment there. I've been praying for you. And then, what is he saying in his prayers? That's the thing. That's the question is, well, then what's the content of my prayers, right? And so he says, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking... 
All right, now I want to give you a kind of an overview. The, the footnote here uh, in the Lutheran Study Bible says that Paul prays for the, in, in verses 9 through 12, Paul prays for the entire Christian life. He's, I think four things is what he, he's asking to, to happen and be present in the Colossians' life. For faith, right? Asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual, spiritual wisdom. For faith. And uh, verse 10, for, for the living of our faith. Uh, so verse 10 would say, as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord of God fully pleasing to him. So we want to have faith and we want to be able to live our faith according to Paul's prayers. And uh, good morning. Passing through? Okay. All right. I'm videoing. So you can... Hi, everybody. Uh, uh, we just have a, a visitor passing through here. No big deal. <laughs> um, so faith and for the living of faith and uh, so in verse 11, for strength when we, when we meet resistance. Don't worry, just make as much noise as you want. It won't bother anybody. <laughs> um, so uh, think of that. Isn't this what we want as Christians? We want to have a stronger faith. And we want to be able to have our faith change how we live. And the third thing is we hope that we can have strength to stand up to resistance persecution, challenges, you know, when people want to question our faith, we hope that we can stand strong and maybe have the right thing to say, right? And so the fourth thing, for the final outcome of faith, eternal life. Paul is praying, I hope they believe, I hope they live in that belief, I hope they can stand strong when their beliefs are challenged, and I hope they can die in their belief. Isn't that beautiful? I think that's wonderful. I, that's the kind of thing a pastor should make into a poster. That's the kind of thing that a, uh, there's these places like uh, Ad Crucem or Red Letter Art and Design. Uh, they, they do Christian artwork and Christian gifts, specifically Lutheran. Uh, but uh, that's the kind of thing that would be put into a beautiful plaque or, or wall poster or something is, you know, that you would have faith, that you would know what to believe. That you would live in that faith of Jesus Christ. That your faith in Jesus Christ would stay strong in the face of adversity. And that finally you could die in that faith. Now, I'm, if I pray this, I'm not praying that you die. I'm praying that you die well whenever it is time for you to die. Right? I don't want you dead. I don't know who you are. But I don't want you dead, um, whoever's watching so I would pray for that. Now, I've heard uh, someone say the pastor's job is to help his people die. What? No, 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 no. Yes, to help you have the faith in Jesus Christ so that even in this life and dying, we can live and die in faith. And so they said, my job is to help you meet Jesus Christ with faith. <laughs> what a new what a way now i cannot change people's hearts you can't drag an unbeliever before me and go pastor have at him go ahead and try i'll try but you know what my job specifically actually is to present the good news of the gospel it will be actually be the holy spirit's job to change the heart right i can tell the good news but I can't say, listen, you darn unbeliever. Uh, I'm sorry if you don't like that language. Uh, listen, you uh, silly unbeliever. you got to believe in Jesus Christ. I can berate him, but that does no good. I could lovingly present it. I can offer the gospel, tell the gospel, speak the gospel, try to live my life that shows him the gospel of forgiveness and grace and mercy and humility before God and before one another. But I can't make an unbeliever believe. It's actually the Holy Spirit that does that, that turns the heart. But the Holy Spirit uses the proclaimed word of God. So it is for us, pastors, and for all Christians, to live and proclaim that word of God, right? So the Holy Spirit will use our witness 
to change people's hearts. We'll use the Sunday school teacher. We'll use the parent, the mom, dad, or grandparent that reads Jesus stories to a child. We'll use the coworker to say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Why? Well, let's, like, let, me, let me show you this Bible verse, and I, that'll kind of sum it up. And whatever you might do, you know, and to say, look, I'm, I'm a mess without Jesus. And with Jesus, I'm still a mess, but I'm at least a forgiven mess. You know, however you want to say it. Um, we try to say it in the way that is true to the scriptures, right? And there's times where we go, did I mess that up? Did I say it wrong? Well, okay, guess what? Sometimes, yeah, we, we said it wrong. We, we messed it up here and there. But I also think that uh, when we are stumbling through our words, the, the unbeliever or the person watching us try to witness says, he's trying to talk about his faith. And he might not have it exactly textbook clear. And, he, and I might have put him on the spot. But he's trying to talk about his faith. And I'm going to listen to him. Right? And I know that happens. Sorry. Uh, I know that happens. That... Uh, as we present the faith, maybe we get a, a detail wrong. Maybe we kind of don't get it quite read, right. But the gospel is still proclaimed. And I'm not saying that we just try to mess it up, try to get it right, right? But as we're doing that, we know that the Holy Spirit is bringing through uh, his work. And maybe he's not, the believer or the unbeliever is not going to believe yet, but maybe he's working on it, right? All right. So, uh, what a wonderful prayer, verses 9 through 11, right? Uh, 9 through 12, that we have faith, that we know it, that we know the scriptures, that we're biblically literate, <laughs> and that we live in that faith, that our life shows it and reflects the truth of Jesus Christ and his word and his desires, that we uh, are able to stand strong against persecution and resistance, and that we die well in the faith, that this faith will carry us through to eternal life, trusting in Jesus. All right. So, um, uh, so that gets us to verse thirteen. What shall we say about Jesus Christ? I think this verse thirteen is a wonderful expression of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verses thirteen and fourteen. If you want to talk, what did Jesus do? Well, here's one way to say it. Verses thirteen and fourteen. He has delivered us. Okay? I want to talk about what Jesus has done. He's taken me. He's taken you. He's delivered you. Now, if you're being delivered out of something, it must be something that's not good. Right? I got delivered from 7th grade. They allowed me to skip 8th grade. Or so, I don't know. But you know what I mean? He has delivered us from. And we're saying, I've been taken in a like a rescue sort of a way. I've been delivered from something. Jesus Christ has or uh, God the Father, has delivered us from the domain of darkness. From sin. From unbelief. From the lies and the deceptions of Satan. You know, this domain of darkness. And, uh, you know, he has taken us out of darkness into light. We're going to get to that light part. Um, and what a way to talk about this. What has Jesus done for you? He took me out of the darkness, man. Now, you may or may not say man, but you know, you're t trying to speak like everybody, just not like a, a Bible professor, right? And, and you might say, you know what he did for my life? He took me every, with life without Jesus would be dark. This is the domain of darkness, where darkness rules, where death, sin, and Satan are in charge. And Jesus has come and taken us out of the domain, the land and rule of death, sin, and Satan. And he has transferred us. <laughs> we have been taken from citizenship to the domain of darkness into a new citizenship. That's using the Philippians language. Uh, transferred us to the kingdom. See? From the domain, he's brought us into the kingdom, the rule of his beloved son. I'm going to have to turn the page, but that's a good place to stop right there. We have been taken from the darkness of sin and Satan, from the lies and the deception, the despair and the lack of hope. And what of, what's the opposite of that? It's the place where Jesus Christ is king. 
the kingdom of Jesus Christ is not really a place it's the condition of having Jesus Christ as your king right you might not have been delivered from Massachusetts you might not have been delivered from Oklahoma or California I'm just picking states by the way I, I'm not nothing against those states right you might not have been delivered from Florida but you've been de delivered from the spiritual condition of darkness into the spiritual condition where Jesus Christ is king in your life and heart. Okay? The, of his son, his beloved son. And now, so what do we say about that Jesus Christ, the beloved son? In verse 14, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You've been taken from darkness into Jesus Christ. And in Christ, you have redemption. You have that, uh, re you've been redeemed. You've been bought back from the darkness and bought into Jesus Christ. Now, how have you been bought? Not with gold or silver or with his holy, uh, but with his holy precious blood, right? The price for you to be brought from darkness to light, from darkness to the kingdom of Jesus Christ, was the life of Jesus Christ the sacrifice of his life into full death so that you might be saved. All right? In whom we have redemption. And what is this redemption uh, by or because of? The forgiveness of sins. Yes. If you think pastors talk too much about forgiveness, it's just because the Bible has forgiveness all over it. Okay? Okay? I just remember this uh, TV show, and, and in the TV show, it was one of these cop dramas on TV, which are fine, but I remember this cop drama, and the, the cop, the detective or whatever, said, you know, whenever I think about going back to the church, the preacher always wants to talk about forgiving uh, criminals and sinners. <laughs> and you can see what the, the person's message is there. How can these people be forgiven? How can they have their sins forgiven when they've been so rotten? Um, now, what that means is that person is struggling with the fact that they too, you know, I'm a sinner too in need of the same forgiveness, right? They might say, well, I need some forgiveness, but please don't forgive that depraved criminal over there. And we've, we've all kind of thought that way, but it's not the right way to think. You, we want that depraved criminal over there to, to get what's coming in, in earthly justice. But may we never wish that someone who might have faith in Christ would be sent to the torment of hell. Okay? I, it, I know it's beyond our imagining how bad hell is. And it's really beyond our imagining how good heaven is. I'm the sinner. I'm the sinner too. All right. Uh, I keep looking over here. It says we have slow internet. So I hope that resumes and doesn't give us any trouble there. Okay. Um, all right. So where are we? We're, we finished vor verse 14. Who In Jesus Christ we have the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. All right. I could talk forever. And I should be able to talk forever about the forgiveness of sins. But there's more to go on. Verse 15, right? Who is this? Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And that in everything he might be pre preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself 
all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. There's forgiveness again, but we'll get to that, right? Verse 13, This is these are some amazing statements that they say, well, how are we going to talk about Jesus Christ? What does the Bible say? Well, in these verses, 15 to 20, amazing things. All right, hold on. All right. The first phrase of verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. All right. So what that's saying there is that God really can't be seen, can he? Right? If you think you've seen God, you might have seen the image of God, Jesus Christ. And if you didn't see Jesus Christ, maybe the image that you saw was not Jesus and was not God. It was a deception or an imagination, right? But I'm not going to try to go there. Let's stay on Jesus. Jesus is the image. The, the way in which we see the invisible God is to see Jesus and to know Jesus, right? If you want to, if you want to know God the Father... You have to know the Son, Jesus Christ. That's what this is saying here. That's what this is saying here. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. He's the image of the invisible God. You can't get to God the Father unless you have Jesus. Okay? That's going to roll into John 14, verse 6 as well. Uh, but he is the image of the invisible God. That's huge. That statement right there. That's huge to say to, to know Jesus is to know God, the Father. Okay? And the second thing, the firstborn of all creation. This verse uh, challenges people, and it can challenge me uh, when I have to look it up and, and remember how to see this. We would go, the firstborn of all creation. Does that mean he's creation? That he's not, he's created? That he's not God eternally? but that he's the first thing God made? And that's not, the, that's not what the rest of Scripture says. <laughs> you know. Uh, but this is saying, so how do we view this, that Jesus is firstborn? I, I believe the best way I can say it is to talk about the, the status of being first in the family. Firstborn makes you the heir, right? Makes you the head of all things so the father has a son and he is the son with the status of firstborn so I'm you and I are not the firstborn in the family we're in the family of God of, in the family of God through Christ Jesus we are Christians which means we are children of the Heavenly Father but we're not the firstborn we don't have all the duties and responsibilities and and perks that come with being Jesus, do we? Uh, we're not the firstborn. Jesus holds that status as first in the family. All right. So uh, over all creation. All right. So verse sixteen then will say, "For by him all things were created." Genesis chapter one. Jesus, so now we're saying this Son of God that we now call Jesus because he was born Jesus of Nazareth, this Son of God, Jesus, was at creation. And he wasn't just at creation, but by him creation happened. All things were created. John chapter 1 is a great verse or uh, chapter for this. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And uh, all things were created through him and there is not anything created that was not created by Jesus Christ the word of God right and so it's saying really Jesus was at the beginning Jesus was at creation and Jesus was active in the creation of all things by him all things were created and I think we can go even further to say uh, still the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are active in every creation, right? You exist because Jesus Christ helped create you. I exist because Jesus Christ helped create me. My dog 
exists because Jesus Christ helped create him. And I should recognize that he is a creation of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. She, actually, she. Um, uh, my dog. But anyway, um, by him all things were made. Where? Is there any limit to this? All things in heaven, all things and on earth, all things visible, all things invisible. Invisible things? Pastor, what are you talking about with invisible things? Well, uh, gravity, time, <laughs> energy, uh, radiation, um, but also uh, angels. All right. Now we got a, here's a sticky wicket of translation. I have two viewers right now, and let's. Uh, I don't. Please don't leave. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it personally. But um, anyway. Uh, here's a sticky wicket in verse 16. Uh, he is the creator of all things in heaven and on earth, in visible and invisible. And then it says, whether it's thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Now, the challenge is some have interpreted it one way and some have interpreted it another way. And... <laughs> Hi, Pam. Uh, and uh, so some have thought of it one way or the other. A and how do you view this? And I, I don't know that there's a definite answer. I'll tell you what the v two different views are. And I'll tell you what my view is. Okay? Um, uh, all things were made even in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. And then it says whether it's, and then it gives a list of things, these thrones, these dominions, these rulers, these powers, these authorities. Uh, powers is in a different translation. Thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities. Um, so the one view is that in any throne, any power, you know, anything we might see as being a great big thing, like he even made the presidential power of the United States. He made the crown of England. He made the the uh, great seat of power in Russia. I, you know, whatever that you know, even the biggest things, Roman Caesar, Julius Caesar, or Nero, or somebody like that, even the biggest things were all made. All thrones, all dominions, all rulers, all authorities were were made. So. Uh, one way is to take a look at this as um, all, even the, the great authorities of, of all the world and primarily thinking of it as the visible things. Now the other way is to look at it as primarily looking at it as the invisible things. So there's an old tradition and I think it even goes back to a Jewish tradition that thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities, and I'm quoting now, uh, these were names common to Judaism and the New Testament of angelic or demonic powers that were thought to control the universe. <laughs> okay, so, like there's angels and archangels, there's cherubim and seraphim, and so some people have thought that maybe it, this is these are other ranks of angels, you know, thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities, uh, along in there somewhere if it's cherubim and seraphim, and all in, along in there somewhere if it's angels, you know, the private first class, um, and, and the archangels, you know, the five-star general. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, so that the thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities may be definitions of the invisible things that were made, the angels, different ranks of angels. Um, that's newer to me and I did not know that for a time now there is not really in my opinion a way that that can be linguistically settled if you hold to that tradition that this is referencing specific angels um, or demons uh, you know that maybe uh, an authority or a dominion is an angel and maybe one of them is a demon version of an angel. If you hold to that, um, there's that's an, an assumption. But to say, no, those are 
talking about not specifically angels, but any kind of throne or authority, that Jesus is higher than all and even made them. Uh, to, to exclude the idea of angels is also a bit of an assumption. Okay? Uh, I don't assume that those are names of angels. Uh, I, it is my assumption that that is a stretch that I haven't been convinced of. So I assume that it's whatever kind of throne or authority or power that uh, might be established in the world. Jesus is higher than it, and, he, and he's the one who made these things, right? Um, he's the one who allows people to form government, right? Um, so it says in verse 16, which this is the easy part, in uh, all things were created through Christ and for Christ. <laughs> I'm making this for my own good purposes, right? So all things. So uh, Christ has designed all of these animals that we don't understand for his purposes. Christ has designed the world for his purposes. And Christ has made you. You were made in Christ and for Christ. Isn't that neat? All right. And so uh, verse uh, 17, And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All right? He is preeminent. He is the, the power and authority. He is the Lord of lords and King of kings, right? And um, he, in him all things hold together. Now, this is the, the part that uh, we would say, which might frustrate um, atheists, is, you know, you, if you're talking to an atheist or someone who doesn't like Jesus and say, and we say, well, we think you're alive because of Jesus, and you're still alive because Jesus wants you to be living. You know, and, and an unbeliever might say, I don't want Jesus. Well, too bad. He wants you to be alive. He's holding you together. Um, all of your atoms are still here because Jesus has not canceled you yet. Ah. Um, you can have fun with it if you know the person who's an unbeliever or if you think that that won't be too rude. Um, I, depending on the circumstances, maybe it will be rude to say that. Um, but in him all things hold together. Verse 18, And he is the head of the body, the church. Right? So now he's, he's the Lord of creation. And he's the Lord of the church too. Right? And now, in verse 18, he is the beginning, all right, he's the first, and he's the firstborn from the dead. Here's our Easter reference. Jesus is the first one to really be resurrected. Now, there have been these other resurrections of uh, Lazarus and people like that, but they also died again. So it seems as if that's not the true and final resurrection. Not it was a fake one, but it wasn't the... A full resurrection, never to die again. The resurrection, right? Jesus is the first born from the dead into the resurrection, right? That in everything he might be preeminent, that he might be first and Lord. And now in 19, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. <laughs> if you get Jesus, you get all of God. If you get Jesus, you get the whole deity. You don't get a half a God. You don't get a partial, like a demigod. Uh, we've been studying a little bit about Greek mythology in our family. Uh, interesting stories, a certain amount of entertainment. We're still trying to maintain that those are fiction, right? So I'm not teaching her or any of us to believe the myths. They're myths, all right? Um, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Jesus was fully God and fully man. And you can't have him be 99, 98, 75, or 50% God because he's also partly human. We're saying he lacked no amount of divinity. 100% God. And he lacked no amount of humanity. Nothing in him was not human, right? He was fully God and fully man. It's not a chemical mixture, 50-50. It's not a genetic mashup. 
it's in Christ you have a fully human person and in Christ you have a fully divine God that's what we call a miracle so don't try to science it out okay don't try to science it out it's called a miracle nothing else works like that nothing in the world um, and through him verse 20 he has brought reconciliation to himself uh, has and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on heaven or on earth in Jesus Christ all things that have been separated from God are to be restored and reconciled to God making peace by the blood of Christ there we go back again that forgiveness that comes through the sacrifice of Jesus the blood of Christ brings us peace with God the Father the blood of Christ I can't do enough chores to make God happy at me again I can't convert people to make God happy I can't do anything to make God happy with me God is already happy with me because he sent his son to reconcile every difference so we have been reconciled to God. God has reconciled himself to us. Second Corinthians would say, now you go and be reconciled to God. You get God's made up his heart about you. <laughs> Make up your heart about God. All right? You know, uh, he's, he's fine. He's loving you. Now we want you to have faith in him. All right? And so there comes all the witnesses to share the Christian faith, right? To help you have faith in him. All right. I think we need to get going here. How much time do we have? Whoa, not enough time. I'm sorry. And uh, verse 21. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you whole, holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. See, um, here is this, you were alienated, you were hostile to God in your mind, and in your doing of evil deeds. You were once alienated from God. You were without God's help or Holy Spirit. And it says in verse 22, He has now reconciled in His body of flesh you. Right? You are now made whole and reconciled to God because of Christ's death in His body, the body of flesh by His death, so that you are now holy sainted sanctified holy and blameless right in christ nothing sticks to you anymore no, no more charge stands against you because you are in christ the one who cleans you up right teflon believer nothing sticks to you anymore because it all stuck to christ right uh, you are holy and blameless. You are above reproach before God the Father because of Jesus Christ. Wow! I could never, ever, ever, ever conceive of being before God with no amount of blame. Right? I feel guilty when I get called before the principal because I know things I might have done in the principal's school that were against the rules, right? To be put before God, oh no, how many of my sins are going to be running through my mind, panicking me? But by faith, we are, or by, by the promise of God in the gospel, the word of truth, we are told you are reconciled and you are blameless before God. You have nothing to fear because Jesus Christ has washed it all away. You're all forgiven. That walk of dread being pulled to the principal's office was awful. Now, I keep... Anyway, um, but being pulled before God will be all joy for the Christian. 
all joy for the Christian to say, In Christ I know I'm forgiven. Your Son, O Lord, you lovingly gave that I may be holy and blameless before you, above reproach. And so, verse 23 is saying, continue in the faith. Don't walk away from this. Continue in this faith. Be steadfast. Be stable. Don't shift from one gospel to another, from one teaching to another. I think I'll be Christian. I think I'll be Muslim. Should I check into Judaism? Oh, that Buddhism thing sounds good, pretty good. Uh, maybe I should look into just financial freedom and just give up on spiritual gods. Whoa, 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 slow down. Quit moving around. He says, be firm and don't shift away from the hope of the gospel word of truth. That has been what you heard. It's been proclaimed to all the world, all creation under heaven, and of which I'm a minister, Paul says, right? He says, I don't... The truth will be found in Christ and in no other hope of salvation uh, will you actually have any salvation only in Christ. And that's what Paul says. Now I guess you can not believe Paul. You can call Paul a liar and you can give up on Christianity. But Paul's saying, oh, don't do that. I want you to stay. I believe this is the only way you can be saved. And I'm saying, oh, don't do that. I don't want you to stray away from God and from the scriptures. I want you to stay and be saved. Yes, and my my uh, timer is an old phone. So we're going to have to answer the call of other duties that are pressing us. Um, I am having to leave for you. Someone said they hate it when I don't get a finish. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm having to leave for you verses 24 to 29. Um, and and uh, this is... Uh, more about how God's Word is changing you and your living in God's Word is a good thing, is a stewardship of living the life that God has given you. All right, but we're going to have to end it here. All right, so um, I, I pray everyone has a great week to still live and remember the great goodness of Easter, the promise of the resurrection for you, because of the resurrection of Christ. All right, let's close with a prayer. Again, the prayers from the Lutheran Study Bible in the footnotes. Thank you, O God, for your patience and persistence to save us through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. God be with you this day, and we'll, we'll see you again next week. All right, bye.